mysterious magi or wise men or kings. They have various names, and I've contemplated that question many times. This year, as I contemplated the question, I got out my children's Christmas books. I have quite a collection of them. And I looked at the various drawings, the artist's depictions of the Magi, in order to get a sense of who other people thought that they were. And I noticed some striking similarities. For one thing, in every single picture, they looked exotic. They looked finely attired in fine array. They looked somber in almost every case. And here's an interesting thing. Oh, they looked well fed. They almost all were on the chubby side. But here's an interesting thing. In many of the books, the three, and there were always three, the three <coughs> magi did not resemble each other. It almost looked, in many cases, as if they were from different lands, from different cultures, as if one came from Asia, and one came from Africa, and another one came from the Middle East. Now that caused me to reflect on why would the artist depict the Magi in that way? And perhaps as we talk today, you can continue to contemplate that. The fact of the matter is, we have very little actual, concrete, biblical information about these travelers from the East, the ones who journeyed in order to find Jesus. For one thing, we don't know how many of them there were. What, you say? There were three. Well, nowhere in Scripture does it say that there were three. It says that they brought three different types of gifts. But we don't know if there were two or, or one gift per person or we don't know. There may have been six. So we don't know how many there were. We don't know from whence they came. We don't know when they arrived. Most scholars surmise that they came from what was then known as Persia that they arrived not on the night Jesus was born, but some time after that, perhaps some months after that. You probably noticed in today's reading, it says that they came to the house where Jesus was. And most scholars think that they were a part of a priestly group whose job it was to observe the stars. They were what was then, or now, called astrologers. Although now we kind of have some negative feelings about astrology. At that time, it was a, a considered to be an important science. And other than that, which is a lot of conjecture, we don't know much about these magi. And so people have used their imaginations, like those artists who drew the the illustrations for the children's books. One of the people that I often read, I mentioned her last week, Barbara Brown Taylor, she describes the Magi in this way. First of all, she is absolutely convinced that there are three of them, and that they are wise. Now, how she knows that, we don't know, but that's what she believes. There's three they are all wise, she says, and she believes, and I had never heard this before, she believes that they came from three different countries, that they didn't know each other at all. And she says that at the same time, each one saw a bright star in the right corner of his right eye. Now, I don't know how she knows that either. <laughs> and she says, now remember, she's thinking poetically, that they didn't know whether the star was real or an object of their imagination. But it didn't matter. They were wise enough to know it didn't matter because the 
Star was calling them out beyond themselves. And so she believes that the three traveled following the star to Jerusalem, where they met on the road. And it was almost as if they had a secret handshake, because they all had experienced the same thing, seeing that bright star. Now, as I said at the first service, if they were from three different countries, how did they talk about it? But details, details, leave it up to me to figure out the details. In any case, they then set out for Jerusalem because they believed that a king had been born, that, that the star was a sign of that, and how else? Where else would a king be rather than at the palace in Jerusalem? Well, that's all very interesting, but it doesn't answer my questions. I don't care so much about the star or where they came from or when they arrived. My question is this, why? Why did they go? Why did they take the risk and I imagine there were various risks. Why did they take the risk to set out to follow that star? Why? In this day and age, if you're preparing for a sermon, this wasn't true when I started my ministry, but it is now, one of the things you do is you look at what people have written on blogs. And there's a pastor named Janet Hunt, who has written a blog called Dancing with the Word. And she asks the very same question I do. Why? Why did they take the risk? Why did they set out on the journey? Why? And her answer is this, and I'm going to explain it, but her answer is that they were living their lives to their natural conclusion. Now see if you can remember that phrase. They were living their lives to their natural <coughs> conclusion. What does that mean? She says, this is, this is what she surmises. They were astronomers, astrologers, whichever one you want to look at it. They were stargazers. That was their role in life. So, when they looked up and they saw this bright star, it was unique, it was different than any other star they had ever seen. What else would they do <coughs> but follow it? And so they did. And as they followed that star, which was because of who they were, their destinies, as they followed that star, as they made that journey, what did they find at the end of the journey? No doubt they were surprised. Here's this humble house. Here's this young woman. Here's this ordinary looking baby. The answer to the question is, at the end of their journey, when they took that risk, they found God. They didn't find God in ways that they might have expected to find God. And in fact, they may not have even realized that they had found God. But they did. And don't you suppose this is far beyond what they expected when they signed <coughs> up with the, the, the priestly group of Star watchers? I mean, probably they said, this is what I like, this is what I do well, this is part of my family tradition, this is what I've been trained to do, I'm going to sit in the, in the palace at night, I'm going to look at the stars, I'm going to write down what I see, I'm going to advise the, the royalty, but this is a sedentary job. This isn't going to require any risk, any... any, any taking any chances, and yet, they were called forth in order to live their lives to their natural conclusion. 
And what if they hadn't gone? That's another question I asked myself this week. What if they hadn't gone? What if they had seen the bright star and they said, hmm, that's interesting, we better write a couple paragraphs about it. Make note of the time it appeared that they had stayed put. Well, let's see. First of all, first thing I thought of, would the story of their encounter with Jesus spread beyond Palestine? Obviously, when the Magi returned home, wherever home was, they told the tale. <clears throat> if they hadn't gone, would that have happened? And in fact, would the religious leaders and the royalty of the people of Israel know about the birth of Jesus if they hadn't stopped at the palace and spoken with King Herod? You know, they might have heard, those religious leaders and those political leaders, might have heard this little rumor from the shepherds about angels and a, a savior being born, but they would have said, oh, that's not who ever heard of such a thing. But when these magi showed up, they had to pay attention. Now, on the sort of dark side of that, that might have not been such a good thing in many ways because you may remember that Herod, when he figured it out he had been tricked and the Magi didn't come back to him, ordered the murder of all boys age two and under in and around Bethlehem because he was jealous. But maybe that would have happened anyway for some reason. <coughs> and because the Magi had come, when Mary and Joseph and Jesus had to flee to Egypt to avoid the wrath of Herod, what did they have to fund their trip? Gold and frankincense and myrrh. But what if, what if the Magi hadn't gone? What if they had said, boy, that's a nice star. It looks like it's leading us somewhere, but boy, are we comfortable here in the palace in Persia. I think the biggest thing that would have happened if they hadn't gone <coughs> is they would have missed out on meeting God. They would have been the ones who were hurt by it. God would have found other ways for the news of Jesus to be proclaimed and for Jesus to be kept safe. But they would have missed out on So, given that, let's think about this <coughs> in terms of ourselves. And let's ask ourselves three questions as this New Year begins. The first one is, what does it mean for each one of us to live our lives to their natural conclusion? What if we nurtured our gifts, our skills, our interests in such a way that they were put to the <coughs> best possible use? so that we live our lives, as the Magi did, to their natural conclusion. Now, someone at the earlier service said to me, I want you to preach about how to figure out what, your, uh, what, what that means for us, what, how you find out what your natural conclusion involves. That's a good idea. I wish somebody would tell me. <laughs> I know for me. I don't know for everyone. So what does it mean to live your life to its natural conclusion? And might that involve, if you, if you take it seriously, taking risks, stepping out in faith, as the Magi did. And if you do that, might you encounter God? But might that happen in unexpected, surprising ways? 
You see, I think that this way of looking at things applies to us individually. Certainly, it applies to us individually. It applies to, it applies to us also as a congregation, as a body of believers. Because we corporately have gifts and skills and interests. And if we nurture and acknowledge those and take risks, then we will find God. Maybe in surprising ways. And that's partly what the church council is going to be thinking about in its retreat this week. And so, of course, we, we ask you to pray for us. <clears throat> but individually, what does that mean for you? I'm going to give you an example to close. This, uh, during the Advent season, I read a book by Pastor Mike Slaughter called A Different Kind of Christmas. He's a pastor of a large congregation somewhere in Ohio. And that congregation is known for the ministry that they do in the Sudan. And what they've done for 20 or more years is at Christmas time they take what's called a miracle offering. And it started out, he started out asking people to give as much to the offering as they gave or as they spent on themselves and their families for Christmas. Over the years, they have raised over six million dollars, and it's all gone to this ministry in the Sudan. And so he is telling the story of this in the book, but he also, also talks about what's happening in his congregation. And so in this particular section, he's talking about the most, what he says is the most maligned of professional people. You might want to plug your ears back there, Rich. <laughs> he says that the most maligned of professional people is the car salesman. <laughs> Not true of rich. <laughs> and of course, Pastor Slaughter says it's not true also. He says that in his congregation, he has three people who own car dealerships who are ab absolutely the antithesis of the stereotypical car salesman. And he talks about each one, but the one that he focuses on is a man named Sam who not only has gone to the Sudan to further this mission there, but also has gone to Guatemala and Vietnam on mission adventures, and is very, very much someone who, who is a cheerleader for that. But Pastor Slaughter says it's not those things that he admires so much about Sam. It's his day-to-day -day way of living out his faith. And so I'm going to read that to you. In his own words, Pastor Slaughter writes, Chris, one of my staff members, recently told me that he had driven Sarah, a single mother, to Sam's dealership. Previously a stay-at-home mom, Sarah was reeling from a bad divorce and a vindictive ex-husband who, without her knowledge, had accumulated significant debt. Her car, acquired in the divorce settlement and the only form of transportation to work, had been repossessed. Sarah arrived at Sam's lot with $4,000 to spend, money from a brother's loan and the church's love fund. Sam had a 2001 Ford Taurus on the lot with 200,000 miles on it that her cash would cover outright. But a few moments later, he put her in a 2003 Buick Rendezvous, a $10,500 value instead, with only 80,000 miles, which was a better, safer fit for her young family. Sam ate the difference in cost, quietly, quickly, and compassionately. He is an inspiring witness to me in word and deed.
You see, that's just one example of what it means to live one's life to its natural conclusion. Sam was a businessman. And in the midst of his business, he lived out his faith so that Sarah, in unexpected ways, encountered who? Not Sam. God. What if we each lived out our lives to their natural conclusion? What if we as a congregation corporately lived out our life of faith to its natural conclusion, stepping out in faith? Who would we encounter at the end of the journey? God. May it be so in 2013. Amen.